Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. No Going Back to Normal, featuring Ken Orphan. Ken Orphan is an artist, writer, radical nature lover, anti-war and anti-capitalist activist, sociologist, spiritualist, and hospice social worker. He writes about art and culture, socioeconomic injustice, geopolitical issues, philosophy, and the existential threats we collectively face from corporate capitalism, the war industry, climate change, and an ever-imperiled biosphere. His work focuses on the desperate need for a global paradigm shift that fosters compassion for, and solidarity with, the suffering of humanity and the countless other species with whom we share this precious planet. I first discovered Ken's writing through Counterpunch and began following him on social media. We regularly end up thinking and writing about similar topics at the same time, and I often find myself adjusting my sales based on his voice and perspective. In our conversation on January 25th, 2021, we talked about whether things will go back to normal, and more importantly, should they? The environmental disaster of the Alberta tar sands and the resistance against them, the globalized indigenous resistance to industrial development, the importance of following indigenous leadership in protest movements, corporate media and media criticism, Julian Assange and the attack on whistleblowers, the suppression of speech on social media, sexual repression in U.S. culture, Pete Buttigieg and identity politics, the end of the Trump era and the opening of Biden time, hope for young people, the dire ecological situation that threatens so much life on Earth, the danger and privilege of nihilism, and everything that's worth fighting for. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. Word of mouth is very helpful in building an audience. Make sure to subscribe so that you're alerted when new episodes are dropped. If you'd like to support this work financially, you can leave me a tip at paypal.me slash colibri or become a member at patreon.com slash colibri. Patreon members get early access to episodes and exclusive material. Also check out my blog, books, and zines at Maxka Moksha Press, which is at maxkamoksha.com. M-A-C-S-K-A-M-O-K-S-H-A dot com. And now, here's my conversation with Ken Orphan. What kind of normal are we going to get back, do you think? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure we should be we should be asking what kind of normal we should get back to as opposed to should we get back to the status quo that was or try to. I don't think that we will get back to um, that kind of normal ever again. Um, But I don't think that we should be looking to get back to the status quo uh, for what it was because of course it was uh, was pretty, pretty awful. Right, right. Yeah, no, pretty much up and down backwards and forwards, inside and out, the whole system was not really functioning well for really hardly anyone at all that was in it, you know? And I think the only people for whom it did feel like it was working um, are people who just weren't paying attention to long-term consequences, maybe. Yes. Well, and the system was was really designed uh, or set up whether it was designed or not, I you know grand plan in it, but um, the way that it was arranged uh, was was not to pay attention to these kinds of crises that uh, would inevitably come up. The pandemic actually was uh, is um, quite mild compared to what it could have been. So we're we're lucky in that way. We're very fortunate. 
Right. You mean in terms of the fact that although the contagious rate is fairly high, that the mortality rate is pretty low? Yes. Uh, you know, when you look at um, various pathogens throughout history, if you go back to the so-called Spanish flu, um, it was much more uh, virulent and much more uh, deadly in a rapid sense. So in this case, COVID is very deadly, but it, um, it is not as bad as it could have been. I, I suspect that uh, there's probably countless pathogens out there that uh, pack a much bigger punch. Um, and hopefully we don't see them, but I, I think as long as we continue to encroach on certain places on the planet that makes us more vulnerable and certainly our practices as, uh, as a society. Right. Yeah, that's for sure. Hey, if you don't mind, I want to back up just for a second. And for people who will be listening to this and watching this, maybe you could say just a few biographical items about you. Uh, for example, uh, I want people to know that you live in Canada, but that you've lived in the United States as well. Yes. Well, I, I lived in the United States for most of my life. Okay. And uh, I, I've lived here in Canada for the last uh, five plus years. Um, and uh, my experience, my background is uh, in sociology and social work um, with an emphasis on, on um, environmental racism and uh, public health for that matter. Wow. So, um, so yeah, uh, it, being in the two different countries, uh, you can see the contrast as well as the similarities. Um, and I think that it's important to draw attention to both. Right, right. So when you're making some of the statements that you do about the United States, you're making these in part as an outside observer. In part, um, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of us uh, Canadians that uh, kind of do this. Um, and, and it's because we, we have uh, the luxury the, the privilege of having dual citizenship. And so it allows us to live in both countries pretty comfortably. Um, the, you know, Naomi Klein is, Klein is one example of that. And there's, there's several other um, people who uh, can't make commentary in that way. Um, so it, it, it certainly helps, uh, but I think it, it helps to have lived in the United States and worked in the United States. Uh, especially as a as a social worker for so many years, uh, because of the my experience with the healthcare system there and with vulnerable uh, populations, um, and to see how the country and actually state by state deals with uh, these socioeconomic problems. Right, which for the most part is not very well. It, it isn't. And uh, it, I want to also say, of course, you know, there's a there's a tendency for um, many Canadians to stand back and, and kind of say, well, at least we're not the states. But uh -huh. of course, we have have so many things here. There, environmental racism is an enormous uh, issue. And of course, we, you know, Canada is a, a settler colonial state. Uh, it, it's founded on the same basic principles of, of um, imperial capitalism. And uh, so, we, in, you know, it's, it's kind of similar to when you look at Europe or Western Europe, I should say. So Western Europe, everybody kind of thinks that this is a socialist place. And of course, it's, it's not. It's, uh, it has some very good socialist leaning policies, uh, policies that help uh, provide a support net and uh, healthcare and those kinds of things a lot more than the United States. Mm -hmm. Same with Canada, uh, provides a lot more than the United States, but they're still essentially capitalist countries. So it's, it's always important for us uh, Canadians to recognize that. Right, right. And, and you uh, mentioned environmental racism there, and that's maybe a good segue to one of the things I wanted to ask you about, which is that as you probably noticed, Biden uh, canceled the XL pipeline Mm -hmm. And that's certainly good news, especially for the people uh, who are working on that and whose, you know, land that was going to go through, you know, et cetera, in, in the United States. And yet, the, um, that's not the whole story. Uh, 
the pipeline is meant, and correct me if I'm wrong, to be transporting products from the Alberta tar sands, you know, uh, I think through the United States to Texas for export or something like this. But whether or not that pipeline is still there, the tar sands are still in operation. Yes, yes. The, the tar sands uh, it took a little bit of a hit. Uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, COVID. Um, and uh, so there were projects that have been canceled or put on hold, um, but they're still there. And uh, it, I mean, this is an area that is essentially the size of the state of Florida uh, of uh, ripped up um, tundra and uh, taiga uh, forest. Um, and much of it encroaches on indigenous First Nations uh, land and do has- mean, do, I'm sorry, do you mean to say that the, the area that's affected is the size of Florida? Yes, uh, oh and actually probably beyond that because okay. It affects a lot of uh, tributaries to various rivers, riverways. Right. Um, and so what we saw in Alberta was a spike in uh, uh, cancer rates among indigenous First Nations. And the, of course, the well-placed, well-moneyed um, uh, fossil fuel industry uh, has done its job to try to downplay this. Uh, you know, you have certainly Health Canada, which has has um, looked into it, but people seem to um, not understand. Uh, a lot of people don't understand. I don't. I don't think that uh, Ottawa, the capital of Canada, is is very very beholden to fossil fuel interests. In fact, there was a, a very good article. Um, I think it was a couple years ago in McLean's uh, about that. Uh, and, and the influence, the heavy influence, the amount of money, the amount of, of um, pressure that goes on uh, between the liberal and conservative parties. So, so there, there's been uh, it, uh, its own kind of suppression here of information. And uh, much like the, the Cancer Alley, say in the, uh, the Midwest of the United States, it's, it's its own cancer alley. It's a smaller population. Uh, this is, we're talking about a very vast uh, area of land that is relatively sparsely populated, especially when you compare it to the states, but it is inhabited by uh, indigenous people, First Nations, who um, rely on, who have relied on, on and, and also stewarded uh, the land there for centuries millennia, really. I mean, um, we're talking, you know, 15,000 years, I think right. is the, uh -huh. uh, the estimate. So for all this time, they have been stewards of this land. They have, they have used um, with care the great resources of this land. And of course, uh, with the age of fossil fuels, Canada saw a, a, a way to join the other fossil fuel uh, countries, and uh, that was the way. Crude oil in the in the form of sand, the tar sands. They like to pre they prefer to call it oil sands, but of course, because it doesn't sound as bad as tar sands. Right. right. But essentially, what it creates is a muck, and it's it's bitumen, which is uh, notoriously toxic and impossible to clean once it gets spilled into the into the environment. So the environmental racism here in Canada, there, there are many, many examples, but that's one of the most glaring examples of um, how the fossil fuel interests uh, in the country are able to get by a lot of these things. And we have to remember too, that Canada prides itself on an image of environmentalism. Um, and much like Germany and other countries, which are also doing very similar things on their own scale. I mean, if you look in Germany, you have that enormous um, field of, uh, of strip mines um, that was threatening an old growth. I think it still is threatening an old growth forest where, where many people were occupying to stop them from, from doing that. So yeah, we, have to, we have to look at all of these countries in that light because they, they, they like to, um, point the finger at the United States. And of course, the United States is the last bastion of late capitalism. It's, it's the fortress. 
but all of these countries benefit from it, uh, from these types of uh, economies. And the, the component of environmental racism is a very, very uh, entrenched part of this whole thing. We have a lot of countries, for example, in the EU, or the, I should say the EU in general, that uh, benefit directly from the tar sands. They don't like to talk about that, of course, but that is the truth. It's not isolated. Of course, you know, the same with the tar sands and the relationship with the United States and those industries. So we have to begin to look at it. I, th I think we have to be begin to look at it in a multinational uh, uh, sense, a global sense, because these companies operate with near impunity on a global scale. And you have Canadian mining companies right now down in Ecuador, which I think, I, I may be wrong in this, but I think they, they uh, hold perhaps 60% of the, of the mining resources down in that country. So you can see then in the political sense, why Canada would then not want to recognize um, the Bolivian government, oh, I'm sorry, the Ecuadorian government. Right. Right. Um, okay. if, it, if it happens to be socialist, mm -hmm. because the socialists, of course, want to nationalize. And the same then goes for Bolivia when when uh, you're talking of uh, Morales. Um, Canada didn't want to recognize that either, uh, because once you do that, uh, the actual people of that country say, we want to make sure that everything in this country, the first people that benefit from it are the people that live here. And of course, uh, environmental capitalism, uh, environmental imperialism doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's that's all true. There's there's a lot that you just unpacked there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, <laughs> and I think Sorry, that, <laughs> no, no, it, it's 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 okay. Yeah, it was it's a just, big box to open. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was a big one to open. But I, I I I then then I have to wonder, you know, of course, you know what how do how do we how do we address this you know what i mean because it feels like the structures uh the established structures of all of these countries are you know pretty well um entrenched do you know what i mean you know and yet uh and yet we have to do something obviously and so this has to do with i suppose not well we can't we can't depend on the system itself to to stop doing these things or to or to be making the right choices, I guess I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I know that a lot of, of uh, success here in, in Canada um, and, and in the United States as well has been to look to indigenous communities for leadership. And then we find that to be the same instance when we look to uh, practically anywhere in the global South. So when we look to indigenous communities, say in Central America or in South America or in um, Papua uh, New Guinea, um, all of these places uh, in, in various places uh, throughout the whole global South are being assaulted. And the, and the first people being assaulted, uh, the ones that are on the front line are indigenous peoples. Uh, they're people of color, they're, they're uh, indigenous people, people that live close to the land, but there are also people that are, um, say, abandoned to what we know now as the term of um, sacrifice zones. And these sacrifice zones are scattered all over the world. So our first, I think the first place to look is of course, what are indigenous people doing? What are these people doing? And to, to ask them to join with them in solidarity and to learn from them, because it's easy to look at the, the, the crisis and the problem and all of the, the things that we're up against, which is monumental. But if we do that and not look at the, the brave, courageous stances that these people are making, uh, often without any publicity, and we see so many um, indigenous and environmental activists who have been, uh, assassinated, murdered, massacred in various countries. Um, Berta Caceres, um, all these different activists, uh, activists down in the Amazon, um, they are, are taking bold steps. And so our response, I think, needs to, to actually, especially if we come from the more white European settler uh, standpoint, which I come from, 
uh, my ancestry is of course white European settlers to this continent, then I think that we need to shift it to, to focus on these, these voices and on the tactics and on the, the strategies and the movements that they're building. One good example is, uh, you know, of course, Morales uh, and, um, and, you know, Moss Party down uh, in Bolivia, uh, tremendous successes. Uh, you don't hear about that, of course, in, in corporate uh, mainstream media as much, and, and it, it isn't cast in that light. But these are tremendous successes and to come back from a coup in that, in that sense, when a lot of people really didn't think that would happen. Yes, I was very pleased to see um, that party come back from the coup. I wasn't expecting it to happen anytime soon if it was going to happen. And so the fact that it did, basically the first chance that they had, they swept the right-wingers back out of power. And that was very you know, encouraging to see. And the right-wingers who had been in power had been very explicit about their anti-Indigenous views as yes. well. You know, same things that were um, very explicit and that you know would even make people you know would even make right wingers and in, in the U.S. political establishment blush. I think you know. Yes, I think it caused a, a lot of embarrassment um, because you don't have uh, you don't have the same uh, blatant racism coming out of figures like Juan Guaido, um, uh, you know, who is pretty much a centrist uh, when you when you compare him to Western leaders same neoliberal kinds of, of uh, uh, policies and, and thought. Um, and, and of course, in Venezuela, the right is also notoriously known for its racism. There's a lot of racism, of course, you know, throughout South and Central America, coming from, of course, you know, the people that can, that claim their ancestry to be more European, as opposed to those who are, are more indigenous. And so that has created that class system and what we saw in Bolivia was that it was on full display. There was no hiding it. And uh, even the Western corporate press couldn't hide that completely. I mean, here you have this, this um, selected president going there with the, the Bible and, and doing a sort of exorcism of the presidential yeah. palace um, based solely on Morale, Morales' um, indigenous heritage. Right. Uh, you can't you can't whitewash that for too long, so it was it was quite quite impressive, um, especially uh, considering the odds that they were up against. Right, right. Are there any other places that you can think of offhand um, around the world that seem to be signs of of hope like this? Well, I I think that there are there are always. I mean, that whenever you look at uh, any any part of the global south, you will first be um, inundated in the stories of of uh, you know so many obstacles uh, and so much uh, poverty and and pollution and all those things are true, but there are also tremendous movements happening in, in say occupied uh, Kashmir, where you have um, people who have been brutally oppressed uh, by an occupying army, the Indian uh, army uh, military uh, under the, the, you know, Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi, who is uh, by all um, definitions, uh, a fascist um, and, and completely, uh, doesn't hide his racism at all. But you have these movements that, that are, are consistently, persistently um, going forward. And then you can even look in India itself and you have um, movements uh, among uh, um, Dalit, uh, you know, the, the caste system where the Dalit are, used to be called, um, you know, the untouchables by, by okay. the caste system. and. They've been brutalized throughout history and continue to be brutalized, but there's, there is an agency there. And I think that that's what we need to look to. When we just see the problem, we don't see the agency that people have uh, to organize and to join together in mass movements, not as individuals, but, but as a mass movement. And so you see that in places like that, you see that in, in Nigeria, where just recently, you have a uh, brutal crackdown on, on uh, democratic, unarmed protesters who were shot at 
And yet there is this tremendous uh, push for democratic, um, uh, not only reforms, but de revolutionary ideas that are happening. And, and I think that it's important to look to those voices beyond uh, the corporate media. I, of course, I read corporate media. I think you have to. You, you have to read it with an analytical eye, an eye, analytical mind, an analytical eye. But you look beyond that, you dig deeper, and, and you'll find these people, these marvelous voices uh, all throughout these, these regions and these countries. I, I uh, admire you for being able to read uh, corporate media and not get uh, caught up in it. I um, recently read something in the in the New York Times. It was about, oh, when the Capitol Hill riot was happening, I checked in with the corporate media outlets just to see how they were covering it, you know? And the, the you know, the New York Times, I can't remember what headline they had, but of course it was, it was um, something about how the riot had been, um, had been caused by a, a speech by Trump. That was the headline, you know? And, and I remember looking at that and being like, okay, I can really unpack this and see everything that's wrong about that headline, you know? And I wonder if I read the Times on a regular basis, if I wouldn't start to get pulled into that worldview. I mean, so personally, just for myself, like I'll read, I'll read The Guardian and I know there's criticisms of that one too, but I feel like The Guardian uh, is not as bad as say The Times or the, you know, or, or the, um, well, the Washington Post is just terrible, especially with um, with 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 Bezos now, you know, be, being the owner, you know. And so, I, uh, yeah, I I look at the media and I see how powerful they are, and I look at how so many times when you have conversations with people, you hear them saying things, and whether they know it or not, they're just sort of parroting something that you can tell they heard just on, on TV, you know, or saw somewhere, and. It seems to me that it's a really big challenge to do what it is that you're talking about. I, it is a challenge and I, I, um, I don't think you can always do it, but I think that it's important to know what uh, these voices are saying, because of course they do still inhabit uh, a dominant sphere in our lives and society. You go to um, any airport, of course this is prior to COVID and, and the pandemic, but you go to any airport or those kinds of places, these public uh, areas, these, these, the commons, if you will, and you'll see um, CNN or here we have, you know, in Canada, CBC or uh, BBC, if you're in Europe, um, you know, all of these, these major, um, you know, corporate entities uh, giving news. And so, I think it's important to read and to listen to what they're saying, but you have to uh, be disciplined, I think, to read critically and analytically of what they're saying and b behind the headlines and, and the words, because there's, uh, there's so much more to the story. We, we know this from so many examples, whether we're reading about Israel-Palestine or we're reading about Venezuela or we're reading about virtually anything where there is a dominant narrative that the, the capitalist state wants to push. And then there's something else, actually a lot of something else out there that offer an alternative view. Some of them are not very good alternative views, but they're there. And, and so I think you have to, to weigh both of them. Right. And I, you know, it, it's a constant challenge of course, because I could never watch, um, uh, what is it, uh, CNN or MSNBC all day. I, I don't see how anyone could could stomach that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would put in a pitch here for um, FAIR.org, Fairness, uh, Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they've been at work since the, yes. at least the early 90s. And so they'll look at the corporate media coverage of a particular issue and they'll go through and they'll be like, here's what the Times said, here's what the Post said, here's what the Wall Street Journal said, here's how they yeah. got it wrong, you know? And yes. I, you know, I'm on their email list and they send out something almost every day and they have a, a, a podcast and interview show too. And I feel like that kind of media, learning media criticism, you know, and reading media criticism is so important because it isn't actually taught in school, 
anywhere. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, unless you maybe got a communications degree, you wouldn't have had any idea that something like media criticism even exists, you know, and yet uh, it's, it's so important. And media criticism is unfortunately one of the things that took a hit during the Trump years, you know, because Trump was constantly, you know, insulting uh, elements of the of the corporate media, you know, CNN, I think was an especially favorite punching bag of his, you know. And so um, there was a portion of the population then that was like, oh, well, we need to defend these things because Trump's attacking them, you know, and without seeing that, well, Trump's Trump's Trump has it all wrong and why he doesn't like CNN. However, that doesn't mean that CNN is right. And that doesn't mean that you need to really spend very much energy defending CNN because, you know, they're big boys. They've got a big budget. They could do it themselves, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, really, I think that, you know, what, 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 what's better to do, of course, is to, is to support, you know, alternative media outlets. But it, it was distressing to me to see how media criticism, which had really only, always been a leftist thing, you know, with uh, Chomsky, you know, et cetera, working on it, Project Censored. These were always lefty people. And to have that one sort of taken from us, you know, uh, and, and now it feels like we have to kind of rebuild that one again, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there was uh, obviously over the last uh, several years uh, with the the whole issue with um, Julian Assange and oh, how yeah. uh, there there's no, I don't think that there's any better, more prominent example of the quashing of press freedom, of the quashing of free information uh, and the attack on whistleblowers than Julian Assange and right. Snowden, Chelsea Manning. That is uh, certainly um, the issue of our times. And yet you had uh, many hack pieces out there from prominent uh, media, even The Guardian, um, which was very disappointing. Mm -hmm. So to see that you have to then understand what are the players involved here? And of course the power of the state is is there. We like to think of ourselves as, as being in democratic states, but it, you know, if we understand, if we look at our societies through the lens of, of uh, you know, capitalism and, and to be more specific, the dictatorship of wealth, then we understand them not to be so democratic. Uh, it is obviously then more the wealth, the, the ruling class, the wealth class, the ownership class, whatever you want to term it, who gets more of a say and their narrative and their interpretation gets more prominence than, than other voices. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's the place that we're, that we're, that we're, we're trapped in, you know, for the moment. And I feel like that is part of what's happening with social media now, because social media is such a big part of media now, you know, in that that's where a lot of people, um, are served their their media, including their corporate media. So there, there's now this additional filter of what the algorithms are are showing there, you know. And there's the examples of like, you know, Facebook um, wanting to make sure that, or saying that they wanted to make sure that the news they were passing along wasn't fake. And so they were going to work with, I believe it was the Atlantic Council, you know, which is like a very very elite organization, you know, that also has ties to like, you know, the security state, et cetera, you know, and like, that's who they're going to use to decide, you know, what's true or not. And it's like, oh, well, if that's who you're, you know, using to decide what's true or not, well, then we're still not going to get the real story and what's happening in Bolivia. Exactly. Uh, because these, you know, in, in a capitalist state, the, the, the agencies of the state become corporations and they become these, uh, these think tanks uh, who often you know, act as a revolving door for a lot of politicians. So the government essentially is the capitalist state, is all these corporations. And it's not to say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever say that what they're saying is all wrong or it's all a lie. I think that that's uh, unfortunately has been a, become a byproduct of the Trump years, especially with the rise of, you know, things like QAnon, right, or um, 
other areas or other uh, phenomenon of, of disinformation that have, have arisen. And, and of course, it's not all to blame on the far right or, or uh, a misled public, but you know, it has to do with a, with a, um, a state and, and corporations who have, and the military industrial complex, which have consistently lied or told half truths or, or didn't reveal the truth until decades later. You know, like with the CIA talking about, oh yes, we did actually support that coup in Iran. But of course it was decades later, so, you know. But with that kind of thing in mind, uh, you know, you have to look at that very critically. Not, I would never say don't look at it. And, and everybody has to, it's timing and dosage, isn't it? So, <laughs> right. you know, it, it's just like any bad medicine. So you, you have to just go with that. You can't take it all at once. But you, I don't think that we should shut it out. And I, I, I have always been an advocate um, for uh, all voices, even, even those voices that we disagree with or loathe, um, because once you start shutting that out, you get what you call an echo chamber. Right. Right. Yeah, no, and, and that's gotten some attention, rightfully so, over the last few years about how social media especially is helping to create these echo chambers, you know, yeah. and, you know, I, I've, I've, I feel like I can see that in my own, in my own feed, you know, you know, for example, how they're, they're just trying to stir particular, you know, things to me, you know, uh, at, at the same time, a lot of the ways that I look at things are so far out there that they can't quite make an echo chamber. <laughs> because <laughs> from, but, <laughs> well, I'll tell you thing. something, uh, it's something funny. Um, because my partner and I have, have laughed about it, that it almost seems like we'll think about something and then all of a sudden that thing is on our news feed. <laughs> I've seen that happen too. And that sounds like a tinfoil hat. I need I need a tinfoil hat, but that's really what it yeah. seems like sometimes. So yeah. yeah, yeah. It does feel like that. Yeah, I did. Um, and I do see ads come up for things after I've had conversations about yeah. them with something when the phone yeah. was in the room. And I've only tried it once, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, a friend of mine was seeing ads that she thought were humorous for, um, it was not a tinfoil hat, but it was, um, it was, I think, underwear that you would wear that had fibers in it that would block, you know, well, because there's all the different rays, right? So it would block these, you know, these <laughs> rays, right? You know, and I was right. like, okay, I want to see some ads for that. I want to see some ads for the the underwear with the metallic and, you know, and so I just picked up my phone and I literally just said, to her, I want to start seeing ads for, right. You know, and, and um, it took 48 hours, but then I did actually. Really? Yeah, I did. I did two days later. Wow. I got an ad like that and I got ads from that from like just, just two different companies because that's pretty limited. There's not a lot of people working on the metallic underwear, but <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not no. quite a market for it yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, obviously that needs more investigation, you know. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Snowden talked about how they were, you know, he, you know, you should put a piece of tape over the camera on your laptop or whatever because they can turn that on or whatever. And, oh, I, I always do. Wow. In fact, I took it off uh, to speak with you. Um, right. Uh, you know, um, it, there's definitely uh, things that we need to do. Um, you know, I... Um, there's been a, a few good books about uh, recently, uh, and I can't remember, I'm drawing a blank on her name, but she wrote a wonderful book um, and it's on surveillance capitalism. And uh, it's so important to read this because this is, it's, it's, it's easy to, you know, for so many people to get lost in a kind of, you know, the conspiracy thinking. Um, where all of these things are, are, it's not a conspiracy, they're quite legal and, and it's right out in the open. And it's it, the biggest, one of the biggest, you know, we were talking about fossil fuels before, uh, you know, as, as being a major source of capital. Well, now of course it's, it's our, us, we are the major source of capital for these companies. In fact, I think, I, think, um, I could be wrong, but I, I thought I read where, where uh, so, social media, uh, and the social media industry is one of the most lucrative in the world right now, uh, which is astonishing. But, um, but that, I mean, that's what you have. You have uh, them making billions and billions of dollars uh, data mining. Right, right, 
Right. Yeah. There, there's that aspect of it. Yeah. And then there's the aspect of, um, well, Ajamu Baraka made a reference to how the public space has been privatized. Yes. That's, that's how he put it in describing the role of social media at this point. And especially with the pandemic uh, leading to fewer in-person meetings and in-person events, the privatized space of social media has become you know, the, the, the public square and the break room and all these other things, you know? And so yeah. now when there's, you know, cause we're, we're now seeing another flurry of um, speech squashing going on on social media, as I'm sure you've, you've noticed the last couple of weeks, you know? Yeah. And so that whole debate has mm -hmm. come up about, you know, whether or not that censorship or not. Some people say, oh, well, that's not technically censorship because it's a private corporation. It's not the government, but then that's where I'd bring in, what you know, Ajahn Mubaraka said is well that that it's that is the public space now, and there's also the element that these private corporations are working with the government as well. You know, some people yeah. say that they are taking cues from what to do in certain instances from the government because they don't want to have anti-trust, uh, anti-monopoly um, uh, actions taken against them. You know. And that that's kind of the stick that Congress, you know, holds over them, you know, but then I, I suppose they have their own reasons just for profit. They have to do with it too. But I know you've definitely had some opinions on, on this, 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 you know, kind of unctuous topic of, of, is it censorship? Is it not, you know, should it happen? Should it not? So if you wanted to say something about that, that'd be great. Well, I, I yeah, it, it is a very uh, difficult, sticky topic because, um, we saw what happened on January 6th at the Capitol. Uh, we saw uh, a lot of these things. Actually, so many of these enormous behemoth uh, surveillance agencies that, that get billions of dollars uh, knew about the plans and knew, I mean, they talked about a lot of these things openly. So it, it begs the question, why censorship now? Um, but I think it also goes, I, I think that's exactly, uh, you know, what you said is exactly true. It is, it's kind of the logical end, isn't it, to neoliberalism, that as the technology grows, as long as neoliberalism remains the dominant economic arrangement and political arrangement, then it, it serves, uh, stands to reason that the commons then would go virtual. And so now, of course, you know, we, we saw from the, the birth of neoliberalism back in, in Thatcherite England and, and, and Reagan and all of these things, the carving up, the slow and steady carving up of the commons. And uh, of course, it makes sense that it would go into the digital realm as well. So now, yes, the commons are that we meet virtually. We're meeting here in a sense in a common, but it is a company and they have shareholders and they have a, a bottom line. And they also uh, do work very closely with surveillance uh, agencies of the state. Um, so all of these things have to be taken into account. Nobody wants to see anyone harmed or killed or, or any kinds of, kinds of these awful things like what happened on January 6th. But I think it really is dangerous to rely on corporations and the surveillance state um, to take that under their control because we saw what happened after 9-11. And, uh, and so I kind of see that uh, happening now. I, I'm, you know, I, I can remember those days after, uh, those years after right. with the Bush administration and they're slow and steady chipping away at uh, civil liberties and also at the same time, uh, people not just on the on the right, but liberals as well, uh, many liberals saying this was good because it was to protect us. Uh, not seeing that the people, especially I think the ACLU uh, just recently called attention to this, that the people that are generally targeted are people that are vulnerable in society, people that are uh, have been traditionally historically oppressed and, right. and uh, disenfranchised. So you're going to see uh, crackdowns, I, I think, uh, on Black Lives Matter and on all of these 
various demonstrations that have come up in the last few years uh, that have been wonderful under the Trump uh, regime. It has galvanized a lot of people to take to the street, to, to actually press back against power. But I fear that under Biden, that the surveillance state will, will slowly, maybe rapidly um, grow and will be unchecked and uh, unquestioned. And that I think should frighten everyone because uh, I mean, we just saw all of these uh, tremendous mass movements against police state violence and against systemic racism. Those would not, uh, I, I could see very clearly that if you, if you designate certain things, certain ways of dissenting as domestic terrorism, well, then that would certainly apply to many of these demonstrations. So it's a very, very, uh, I think it's a very dangerous place to be in. Right. So we're actually talking about two different things here at once, which is the social media, uh, which is squashing speech, and then the proposals uh, that have been coming uh, quite explicitly uh, from the Biden camp for a new domestic terrorism legislation in the U.S. And, and uh, I like that you talked about them together there, because, of course, they will they, they will they will work together. They will be woven together. And it's interesting because I wanted to talk to you about the domestic terrorism legislation. And when I was uh, messaging you before, and we were just using Facebook Messenger, I was like, mm, I'm not actually going to type that those words right there because I, what I've been noticing, and I'm sure you've seen it too, is that is that right after the sixth and leading up to the inauguration, there were lots of people who were saying, oh, I. Facebook tells me I can't post this now, or, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. And then there was stories of like, oh, this person's not on here anymore. And so there was like a big push that all of a sudden happened there. And it was obviously related to people mentioning certain topics or using mm -hmm. certain words. And so since yeah. then, I've been like watching my, um, watching my tongue even more closely than I usually do on social media. And I've always been careful on social media because I know that, uh, they're recording everything and that it's somewhere. And a smart friend of mine uh, once said, don't say anything on social media that you don't want brought up in discovery. You know, <laughs> like if they, <laughs> right. <laughs> if they, <laughs> if you're in court for some reason, they're trying to dig up something on you. Well, they'll be able to get into all of that, you know? And so, yeah, there's, yeah. there's, you know, there's, there's topics I don't talk about or, or whatever personal interests, because it's like, mm, no, that's, that's no good. But now I feel like it's, it's just been ramped up again, you know, and, you know, I'd already noticed things like, you know, don't mention that country in South America that begins with a V or no one's going to see that post. I mean, yeah. so I almost see that, you know, we'll be heading in this direction where we'll be need to be speaking in code somehow, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on social media. And you see this to an extent where someone will like replace a few letters with a numbers or something like that. So it's not the exact mm -hmm. word. I mean, you know, maybe that'll have to be what we'll need to do because uh, it's, it's, it's becoming challenging to talk about mm -hmm. current events without using words that are going to trigger them at this point. Mm -hmm. Sir, so, if that makes me think of the, um, what was it the, with the QAnon? Um, I, th I thought in QAnon they had one um, phrase that included letters and numbers. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I thought that that's what uh, I remember reading. And I and I wonder if that's what their object um, object was there to to also speak in a coded uh, language. I, I know that also they they used. Um, just the uh, an abbreviation or initials for right. what they were their message right um, but yeah it, it does bring up those those uh, you know I mean we're, we're in an era that I think um, really is about uh, this this dichotomy of open communication where people are able to talk to people all over the world and uh, directly, and at the same time, then you have a, uh, a surveillance state that, of course, is built around controlling that, uh, policing that, policing language. So it's, it's always going to run into conflict when you have that. But that's why I think we have to be vigilant about it. And I, 
with when it comes to social media and the internet, I used to be thinking, oh, I, you know, I should be careful about what I write about. Or, and then I thought, no, <laughs> I'm going to live my life as free, I think, as I possibly can. And it kept me up at night <laughs> thinking about that because it's terrifying. Um, but the alternative then, I thought I, I would be living again uh, in a closet and I just can't do that. Right. Now, that's not to say that I'm just going to hand over to NSA, <laughs> whatever I'm thinking or, or whatever, but, but I think that we have to also um, find a balance for ourselves to, to speak courageously and, um, and, uh, and to live our, our most liberated selves, which is a very hard thing in this, in this day and age. Right, right. Besides just social media, you mean, or? Well, social media, and also I think because we are in a in an era of um, of late capitalism, uh, the, it's the most brutal, uh, ruthless phase. Uh, you see, uh, you see people all the time that become victims of you know whether you, whether you want to call it cancel culture or whatever um, that you know, of course, what we say and how we act and behave, you know, everything that we do and say has consequences. But unfortunately, it, it's created a sort of a mob mentality. Uh, and, uh, and then people's lives are ruined for, um, for one infraction that years ago, it wouldn't have happened. Um, and I, I'm not talking about, you know, someone uh, committing an assault or something like that, but but, but really just um, you could maybe even call them thought crimes, um, and that's that's really uh, I mean my goodness if uh, uh, some people who, who maybe um, click like on something and then forever you know they're called on that one choice to click like, yeah. um, which when you really look at it is completely absurd, but. Um, that's where we're at. So I, I, it seems, I think the illusion is that we are um, liberated, but really it's more like, you know, a uh, guide to boards, a spectacle. It's, it's, we are being bombarded with images that tell us how liberated we are or how we're living our best life, but it's really an illusion. And it's really uh, um, a product of late capitalism and the and the commodification of everything in our lives, including now down to our, our feelings, um, our responses, our right. likes. Right, <laughs> right. I feel like we see this a lot around topics of sexuality as well, where, and I don't know how different Canada is, but the United States, you know, being such, uh, at the same time, being such an over-sexualized culture, you know, in its imagery, and then at the same time being very repressive in what it really wants to allow and, and, and disallow, you know? Yes. Well, there's always been that, that uh, contradiction in the United States. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, of good pieces written about this, uh, but um, it, it, it goes back, of course, I think to Puritanism and, the, and that, that uh, legacy, Calvinist puritanical right. um, mindset but uh, then you, you uh, juxtapose that to capitalism. And of course we realize then of sex sells. Right. So how do you justify the two? Well, you have to have a very, um, a, a kind of internalized uh, punitive um, code and, a, and an unspoken code. So it's, it's okay then I can go into the supermarket and see um, greeting cards uh, with half naked people on them or, or magazines with celebrities, um, you know, who just received the latest surgery to do something and, um, and you know, again, scantily clothed. But if, if the average person does those things, it's, uh, it's quite, it's a different metric. And, uh, and, it, and it goes into how the United States really is a is one of the most legalized um, countries in the world. It's it's punitively legalized. Um, 
if that's the right word or term, but that there are so many laws on the books and new laws are created every day that, uh, you know, you're probably, we're probably breaking one now without even knowing it. Right. So these kinds of things, I think, emanate from um, the ethos of the country, which was really founded in Puritanism. And then that you join that with capitalism. And of course you get this constant um, friction. Right, right. Because it seemed like, you know, this was of course part of what was being addressed by the liberation movements of the sixties was yes. the, the repression and the wanting to break out of that. And what, and this is where we got, you know, free love and all sorts of other, you know, expressions that happened at that time. And, you know, there was definitely missteps. And I hear stories, you know, from the, those times from people who were around who were like, well, at first free love just meant that guys got to sleep with as many girls as they wanted to, and girls were still sluts. I mean, you know, I've, I've heard these kinds of, you know, things, you know, obviously, but, you know, it does seem like that era really did open up a lot of questions that needed to be opened up. It, and, and the liberation movements that came out of that had results that were good and that we're still feeling now. I mean, uh, Stonewall happened, you know, two weeks after I was born, you know? And I, I like to feel like, uh, I, I like to feel that there was a spark of that, that, that I felt, you know, even at that time that, that helped kind of push me, you know, in, in, into the world, you know? That was yeah. 1969, that summer there, you know? And, you know, I, I um, you know, cause in the, in, 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 and that started something that had to happen, you know, because, uh, homosexuality was still considered to be a, a disease, you know, by the mainstream, you know, psychiatric establishment at that time in the 60s. And of course, there was all sorts of laws, some of them explicit, some of them implicit, where you could just be thrown in jail, sometimes just overnight, but sometimes for longer if you were caught, you know, doing things, you know, I mean, so, so obviously, you know, something had to happen, you know what I mean? And, you know, I see, all of the progress that's happened over the course of my lifetime. And it's really encouraging, you know, like I was growing up in the eighties in Omaha, Nebraska, and wow, talk about a time and a place to be, to be like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not straight. I'm trying to figure this out. How, you know, I've whole fit the whole figure out the whole coming out thing. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, it was torturous. You know what I mean? It was completely torturous being, and I got away from Omaha as soon as I could, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I moved to Minneapolis and that's what you did at, at that time in the early nineties, you know, if you're, if you were gay or wondering is that, is it you moved to Minneapolis? And of course that was a perfect thing to do. There was a whole scene there. It was, you know, it, it, it was, it was great, you know, but, you know, I, I, I bring all this up just to see, just to be like, well, we, we've had these movements and well, and then, and then the difference in Omaha even can be seen at this point, because in 2016, when Trump was elected and there were there were some protests there and there were some walkouts in the schools, there were some walkouts in the high schools and the big public high school, I saw pictures and there were kids carrying rainbow flags, you know, and it brought a tear to my eye because I'm like, wow, high school kids carrying rainbow flags, this would not, I mean, that never would have happened when I was going to high school in the eighties. So that's wonderful. I see that. And like the fact that young people have such a better time, you know, uh, they have such a better setting to figure themselves out now than they did before, you know? Like, it's really yeah. just like, a, oh, here's the things you can be. Here's the questions to ask yourself, not also having to deal with like feeling like you're completely wrong, you know, or broken or, you know, like, like uh, you know, like I had to feel, and I, I, feel, I feel like we're probably about the same age, you know, but, but, um, I was bringing this up part because I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, Pete Buttigieg, you know, who Biden has just uh, uh, nominated him to be the secretary of transportation. So if he is confirmed, then he'll be the first openly gay member of the cabinet, you know? And mm -hmm. so on one level, this is good in that, okay, that is in that for the pe young people who are around now, Here's just one more example of how, look, it's just not a big deal, you know, or it shouldn't be a big deal for you to, you know, to have the feelings you're having to, you know, whatever, like, but at the same time, I feel like there's that, I don't know if you want to call it tokenism or, or what you want to call it, where the system is able to, the system is able to adjust itself and absorb people and certain ideas without changing itself really at all, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's, it's um, I think, you know, kind of an example of uh, what you would call identity politics. So um, 
you know, I'm, I, I personally feel that, you know, I know that there are many people on the left who uh, are very much against identity politics or any kind of thing that smacks of that. Um, I, I don't take that approach because I do believe, I see, and I understand even on a personal level, um, I know people are persecuted for their identities alone. Right. Um, uh, LGBTQ people, um, uh, the disabled, um, Muslims, you name it. Your identity, especially uh, when you live in a, in a white settler colonial society, the legacy of that, um, then you are, if you're not persecuted, you're looked at differently, maybe less than, mm -hmm. um, and maybe discriminated against. Uh, there's certainly prejudice. So I, I understand the importance of identity. And I think it's so important for people on the left um, to not completely dismiss these things because in a sense, you're alienating uh, all, most of your base. Um, but, you know, I, I was talking with uh, um, one of my uh, indigenous friends who had said, you know, you, you can talk, people can talk there, if you're white, especially, you can talk your, your head off about um, uh, Marxism or, or uh, socialism or, or, just, or just general anti-capitalism. But if you don't recognize the long legacy of persecution based on my identity as an indigenous person, um, you know, you're not gonna have an audience and you can't expect people then to listen to a word that you're saying. And, and there's so much truth to that. So we have to recognize identity and, and its importance, especially given this long legacy. But the cynicism is in how these political parties and entities use identity to, right. um, to continue, like you were saying. They don't have to be questioned. They're, the main paradigm of what they are and who, what they do and how uh, the whole mechanism of, of, of their um, being is not questioned and it doesn't have to change because now we have a black person or we have right. uh, an Asian person or we have right. a woman or we have an LGBTQ person. And so unfortunately that obscures uh, the other side of the coin, which is what most leftists are concerned about as well, which is material concern and concern for the, for the well-being of the biosphere and militarism and all those things that are, are pushed away when you just focus on identity. So it's great that um, a person like Buttigieg is, is in this position. It's, it's great that Kamala Harris is in this position. But if we don't also look at the, the very well-documented legacies uh, of these two people and, uh, and basically everyone that fits into that bill, um, then we're missing uh, the, the larger picture. For example, Buttigieg, you know, going to Afghanistan and, and not talking to one person uh, of, from Afghanistan. I mean, this was in his book. There was, there's, no, there's no documentation anyway of him actually having a conversation with um, uh, an Afghanistan uh, citizen. And then you have Kamala Harris, which, uh, you know, her record, of course, of being um, the law and order, you know, you know the, the, the cop and all these kinds of, of um, designations. And it's because of her, her, her draconian um, uh, stances when she was uh, in California. So, you know, if, you, if we're just gonna talk about their race, about them being gay or queer or trans or, or Muslim or whatever, then, then we don't have to talk about those things because those, make, those things make the state and, and the ruling class the most uncomfortable. Right, right, yeah, you put that well, you put that well, yeah. You, you speak a lot of my thoughts there because, you know, I'm glad to see a world in which, you know, Pete can get on, can get, get in, can get in the cabinet, you know, but at the same time, I never really liked Pete's politics very much. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I didn't agree with a lot of what 
he had to say. And, and you know, lots of people have talked about Kamala's background, so we don't have to get into that too much. But I've looked into it. Yeah, and it's 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 terrible. You know, she she hasn't you know she hasn't she hasn't been a friend to the to the underclass you know at all. <laughs> there, to say yeah. the, to say the least. Yeah. 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 So I just, I, I look at where we're, we're at now and with, with, with Biden coming in and I, I haven't voted for a Democrat since for president since 92 with Bill Clinton. And I became disillusioned with the democratic party at that level at that time, you know, and I voted for green people a few times in there. So at this point, I don't have quite the same strong reactions that, that maybe I once would have when the presidency changes, because I, I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't have a car in that race to some degree or whatever, you know, like, yeah. uh, and so, and so I'm looking at what's happening now. And obviously, you know, for the orange menace to no longer be a daily part of our lives is, is definitely a relief. Of course it is, you know, yeah. like, and the fact that his people got knocked down a notch, that's great. Those people that they, they needed to get knocked down a notch. They were feeling too brave. They were feeling too empowered. Like, no, that's, yeah, they, you know, uh, at the same time, I don't feel particularly, I don't feel particularly optimistic about the time that we're coming into right now, you know, either. And I was seeing Thomas Frank yesterday. He was on, uh, uh, he was on Useful Idiots. I don't know if you ever watched that. It's with um, uh, Matt Taibbi and um, Katie yes. Helper. Yeah. And, 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 and he was on there and he was talking about something which I had noticed, but I hadn't put into words yet, which is that the elite of the country, the corporate elite, the media elite, and much of the political elite has really come behind Biden in a more united front than any way that he said that he's seen in his life, you know, mm -hmm. that he hasn't, you know, that really almost all of industry except for oil lined up behind Biden, you know, Wall Street did, you know, the military yeah. industrial complex, you know, the oil still went, most of the oil money still went to, 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 to Trump, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, he was really making this point. And it was something that I'd been noticing too, at least in terms of the media, because I, the media was really pretty naked and it's, um, and it's, and it's wishes for Biden to be in next. You know what I mean? Like, like there was definitely, and, and I saw this with Hillary, you know, too, where I was like, wow, I haven't seen them be so obvious about, you know, who they, who they want, you know? And, yes. and so, so I feel like if we're entering a time where the elite are more united than they have been before behind one person, that that's really a big red flag. Hmm. Well, I, I, I would agree with that. I think that certainly the, the ruling class understands on on various levels because you know it's easier to, easy to talk about you know the working class the ruling class as if they're one big monolith and right. of course that's not true there's competing factions with all, within all of them but one thing is is most definitely true is that you know when you get into those higher echelons it becomes uh, very obvious that it is about um, the well-being the capital well-being the material well-being of that class. And so they, I, what I would surmise is that they saw um, in Trump that, uh, you know, whenever you have someone who's this obvious megalomaniac, narcissist, sociopath um, with, with proto-fascist leanings, right. um, obvious racist uh, and, and just unhinged, um, that's not good for business either. Right. And of course, you know, the American empire is about business. Uh, that's what the military is really there for. We have eight, 800 plus military bases around the world. And of course they're there to protect the material interests, the capital interests of that ruling class. So it's, it doesn't surprise me that they would of course back Biden in that regard because they want their, their assets protected. Um, that said, of course, it was good that Trump was was removed because um, obvious uh, the obvious existential threat of, of a man who has uh, access to the nuclear codes and not not to mention all of his dismantling and and uh, the deregulation for environmental policy um, along with a host of other things uh, horrible things like caging kids and 
and all of the other terrible, terrible things. Um, that said, uh, we're entering now a phase where neoliberalism is really going to be, I think, put on trial. Um, they're, they're going to definitely try to push it through because the status quo has worked for them so well. And if, if right. it works for you that well, why should they change it? But they're getting pushback, which is, which is good uh, from progressive and left-leaning people and, and uh, anarchists, socialists, Marxists, what have you. And so that's a good thing. And so Biden has been forced to include in his cabinet a few people that are more progressive, whom I don't think he would have ever chosen were it not for that, um, that massive pushback. So there are some things to be said that there are gains. What I fear is that people, um, that there will be a, a lot of people who will become complacent again. And when I say a lot of people, I'm really referring to, uh, you know, white, uh, middle class, middle to upper class, um, you know, management class liberals who are feeling very comfortable now that Biden is in and feel like, oh, I can sit back because, you know, a person who is mature and who is, is you know, grounded and all of these things and, and in perhaps in many of their minds is, um, left-leaning or progressive, even though he's not, um, he's in control, so I don't have to worry about it. Of course, you know, we, we know how that works out because, we you do. know, we look at the Obama years, of course, you know, and we see Occupy and we see the, the bailout of the banks and we see uh, Standing Rock Sioux and we see all of these things that happened under Obama. So, um, and that, that of course gives me encouragement too, because, um, you know, I, I was part of Occupy. Uh, it was a tremendous time. And I don't look at that as that time as a failure at all. Uh, I think it, it was a, a nascent period for a lot of people to become open to ideas about capitalism, about war and militarism and about the role of corporations and banks and politicians in that whole scheme. Um, so hopefully that will happen again because I mean, you know, really Biden being elected, black people, unarmed black people are not going to stop being shot by the police. Biden being elected, the, the fossil fuel industry is not gonna stop. The, the war industry, the, the, the tremendous profiteering off of war, it's not gonna stop. Uh, all of these things uh, will continue. So, that's that's where the struggle needs to and I, I think I really from un understanding and knowing a lot of my friends and colleagues and comrades that's not going to stop they're going to continue to push and press but again it's kind of like uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr who you know his main concern was about the white moderate and what that could be translated today is the white liberal um, and it's because of their uh, you know in his era of saying you know, not too much, kind of weight, you know, and, and that sort of thinking, that complacency. Right, the, the now is not the time thinking. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. So yeah. that's my that's my fear, but I, but I, I, I try to temper that with the, the notion and the, and the reality that there is also a huge amount of, of um, people who have learned a lot who are not going to back down. Right, right, and and there, it's definitely true that there were those movements, those leftist movements that that came up during Obama's time, and at the end of Clinton's uh, era, we saw the corp, the anti corporate globalization movement come up, you know, sparked especially by the the big events in Seattle, you know, yes. and really that was yeah. yeah, and and that was uh, that was when you know a, a movement in the United States, you know. Uh, joined a movement that was already underway in the rest of the world, you know, mm -hmm. and that's when I became involved in activism at that time. I was really inspired by it. I was around 30 at that time. And the, the influence from the rest of the world in that movement was a really powerful part of that movement. You know, there was an international solidarity that was happening, you know, around being opposed to this corporate globalization and, and opposing these 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 corporate these these um global organizations you know and i and so i look at that and i look at what happened under obama and i'm like okay well 
then we know that we can still have a we can still have a decent and for real resistance, not a hashtag resistance resistance. You know, even though a Democrat is president, and the young people just aren't buying it either. You know, I also look at yeah. that and I'm like, wow, the young people now are so much fucking smarter than when I was that age. I did not have any kind of analysis like that when I was 20 or 18 or 24. I mean, the things you hear these, these, these people saying, it's just, it's, it's amazing, you know? And so I really, you know, personally, I, I, I do feel hope for the future for that. You know, the only, the only thing is, 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 you know, will the young people have time to do something? Because of course, these other, these other forces that are at work in the world as well, you know, and climate change is getting, you know, worse, you know, uh, always at a faster rate than we expected. It seems like every headline is, oh, this is happening 20 years before scientists predicted, 50 years before scientists, you know, this is, well, that, that's the status quo now at this point is to be getting this stuff more drastically and faster than expected. And so that's my, my fear is that the young people won't, won't, won't have their chance, you know, mm-hmm. but, you know, so, so in the meantime, I, I also, you know, am looking, you know, to, to the indigenous and to the young people in general, you know, uh, as well um, uh, for, for leadership at this point, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 51. I'm not supposed to be an innovator at this point anymore. Now I'm supposed to help support the innovators, or at least that's how I look at it. So. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there, there's a, a tremendous um, uh, impetus there. Uh, there's a lot of, of, uh, of things to, to be excited about. Um, of course, they are. Uh, I think, you know, the, the next generation, in fact, is going to be facing the most monumental challenges. Um, we know that, you know, pretty much uh, catastrophic climate change is locked in. Right. And um, I, I, you know, I, it's hard. It's actually even getting harder to find people that deny that even in the corporate uh, media or in, in more mainstream academic right. circles, because the, the, um, the evidence is, of course, mounting. Uh, so, the, the, you know, the, we have a future that is going to be uh, pretty tumultuous, and it is an existential crisis as well for, for not just our species, but for so many other species that we share this this wonderful planet with. And how many species have succumbed? We don't even know that their names, uh, or we have, I should say, we haven't named them. Right, um, they're gone. Um, due to our hubris and and, uh, and and industrial society, but I also feel that it's important to to push back against a, a sense of nihilism, because that nihilism is is something which courts fascism, and uh, that's not the future that I I want to have. If I can't control, we can't control certain factors. There, there are going to be some very severe environmental impacts, um, some, some terrible um, catastrophic uh, collapses of ecosystems. Um, but if we court nihilism, I think then we invite a more hor- horrible, more um, unjust and atrocious future uh, with, with a, a type of fascism that we've never even seen. So, so I, I, I try to push back against that and I try to see all of these wonderful things that people are doing. And especially um, like you said, and, and what I was saying earlier uh, in, in indigenous communities around the world. Can you say just briefly a little bit what you mean by nihilism? Well, As opposed you know, to say cynicism or? Well, it's, it's, it goes beyond cynicism because I think, you know, when we think, when we talk about nihilism, we're really talking about that there's no point to existence, that there's no point mm. to our existence specifically as human beings. Um, and the reason that this kind of thinking can lead to fascism is because it allows for atrocity. It says, what's the difference anyway? We are all um, fundamentally evil. So you, ha- you have this, this uh, um, you know, it's kind of, in a sense, a, a, a um, Calvinist way of thinking that, that human beings are inherently fallen and evil. Um, 
but you know, nihilism operates without a, a, a deity. So it, it's very, very scary to, to think of people that throw their hands up and say, who cares? Um, because then it invites a, a future, even if it's it, if it is um, our existential uh, calling card, it courts a, a future that's far far um, more un, unimaginable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I, I see the, I see what you're talking about. I see that in certain discussions, especially when it comes to talking about the the, the climate, and I, it's just not in my constitution to feel that personally. I just feel like there's there's always a, a fight to have and there's always a purpose and that there's just so many non-human creatures in the world, you know, uh, to whom we owe something, honestly. We, we do owe uh, everything to them, to right. all of these marvelous species, the, you know, flora, fauna, moss, bacteria, all the things that we would, this pile of skeletons and, and flesh would be nothing without all of these things. And how could we possibly give up? We always talk about our, you know, the children of future generations. Well, what about the, the offspring of other species, no matter what they are and, and how marvelous all of that is. And then aside from that, um, music, art, culture, um, okay. cuisine, everything that makes life worth living. So this, uh, I, I, you know, have been uh, kind of on the sidelines in, a, in, in some groups that, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, climate change as being a, you know, a near term extinction and that in that sense. And I don't, I don't think that there's any way to know when extinction, uh, if extinction or when it will happen. That's, that's just my personal view. And um, I know others would disagree with it and offer various scientific documents to try to prove me wrong. Right. But, but my point really being is that what I noticed in, in a lot of these circles is this kind of nihilism, um, a kind of uh, throwing your hands up um, way of thinking. And, and another uh, characteristic that I noticed from a lot of these groups is that they happen to be white and that they happen to be from the global north, and that they happen to be of a more privileged background socioeconomically. So of course, when you're in that, it kind of gives you a lot more leeway to be nihilistic, because right. you have those material comforts right now. And, uh, and that's, that's the danger there. We, we can't let ourselves fall down to darkness. I, yeah. I, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've been yeah. talking for quite a bit of time here. I, I think we covered a lot of territory. <laughs> it's <laughs> you, been wonderful. Want, yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it as well. Um, do you want to tell people where they can follow your writing? Oh, well, uh, just Google me. <laughs> you can find my writing at uh, kenorphan.com or you could go to Counterpunch. Um, and I also have pieces on uh, the Hampton Institute and a few other, other places that you can probably find on Google. Oh, Hampton Institute too. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I've only gotten one piece on there. I feel like that's really a badge, you know, to be on there. So yeah, they're a great, great organization. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate them. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Ken. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's really been an honor and a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.